Moving on to our last segment, the panel discussion. Before that, I would like to introduce uh, dearly to our panelists. First, we have Mr. Jonathan Lee, the Executive Director of Ecosystem Development of Magic Malaysia. We have also Mr. Paolo Calado, the Small, Medium and Corporate Lead of Microsoft Asia. Mr. Leroy Ma, the Business Development Director of NEM Blockchain and the moderator, Mr. Shah Muhammad Ali, Director of Product and Innovation of Brief Asia Technology Perhat, as they discuss about the future of e-marketplaces. Please give a warm a round of applause to our panelists. Right. Thank you, Sophia, uh, for the introduction. Uh, and thank you to Hussam and Wilson, who've covered a lot of statistics that we wanted to discuss. Uh, so <laughs> they've made our lives uh, a, a little bit easier. Uh, pardon me, I'm a bit under the weather, but uh, it's all right because the panelists will be doing most of the talking. Um, um, from a, a starting point of view, um, we're talking about um, how e-marketplaces are going to evolve. Um, in order to understand um, evolution, we need to, uh, future evolution, I mean, um, we need to understand where we are and where we come from. Um, for a marketplace standpoint, uh, let's uh, discuss from an aspect of functionality and utility. Functionality is basically, basically what something does utility is uh, the function of usefulness how useful is something so now let's take an example of of a marketplace that we all uh, we will use copy tms in in the 1970s and 80s uh, they had this i mean they still do have them in p areas of pj and in bangsar and in kl where you've got a space where you have got a lot of vendors uh, trying to sell, um, you know, fruits, and vegetables, and snacks and whatnot. Um, that was basically a marketplace for a area or a street or a taman. So the function was that owner of that space will be collecting rent, and uh, the vendors will be engaging in trade. Moving on to 1990s, early 2000s, um, the space got a little bit bigger. Now uh, we have um, shopping malls where you have a lot more vendors. Uh, shopping malls attract a lot more people as opposed to Kopi Tiams. Kopi Tiam would have been just one street. Um, shopping mall would be um, people within 10 kilometers of the vicinity. Um, the functionality remains the same. Um, the owners are collecting rent, uh, the vendors are engaging in, in trade, but the usefulness or the utility has, has evolved. Um, we have a lot more variety of vendors coming in due to the expansion of space. So we've moved from street to the city. Now, when we're looking into the virtual space or e-commerce um, or e-market space, um, the function again remains the same. The platforms are actually charging the vendors. Uh, the mode of transaction might be different. Uh, they might be, they may not be uh, direct rent, but the functionality is still the same. But the utility again has evolved further. Now, having boundaries is no longer something we talk about. Um, someone sitting in Malaysia can actually buy stuff uh, from the UK, I mean, Amazon is a good example. Um, so usefulness keeps expanding and the usefulness at this moment of time is driven by technology. It has given rise to different um, business models. Um, previously we were, or vendors or businessmen considered headcounts as one of their prime um, spent now it's how much bite are we going to spend on how much 
are we going to evolve in the future? This is where we are going to c continue our discussion with our di distinguished panel. Um, they will, of course, talk about uh, what would be the next technological wave that will evolve marketplaces in the future. Also, they will elaborate a little bit on um, the policies that are driving these changes, uh, the technology emergence that is going to happen in the future. We're talking blockchain, and AI, the impact of technology towards um, uh, how businesses are run. Uh, will, we, will it have more impact on the functionality as well? or it will just be on the utility. Uh, with that, uh, I'll start off by asking Jonathan uh, to give an overview on the pain changes that are going to happen from a policy and ecosystem perspective. Uh, policy is always a, a tough, tough area to, to look at, but um, I, I just want to just start on just asking a question on how many of you guys have heard of magic and what we do. Just hands up very quickly. Okay, so not, not that many <laughs> of you guys, uh, but that's fine. Hopefully today we can help you know, rectify that. So, so I come from a government agency uh, known as MAGIC. Um, it's a very long name, the Malaysian Global Innovation and Creativity Center. Predominantly what we do is we're a nation building agency that works with entrepreneurs. Um, entrepreneurs that wants to scale businesses um, and uh, what we view uh, scalable businesses are business with um, interesting business model, uh, new and innovative business model and usually having technology as an enabler to drive that kind of growth that you want to see in an exponential business. So predominantly that's what we do. Um, although uh, a bulk of who we work with are startups um, and social enterprises. We also are work. We also do work with um, SMEs and corporates in areas of innovation, where we help them explore new business opportunity, new business model, and looking at technology solution that can either increase um, efficiency, reduce cost, reduce wastage, uh, to provide a better, I guess, margin for for businesses. So, in a nutshell, that's what what Magic does. Uh, in terms of policy moving forward, I think Wilson, uh, the earlier speaker, actually has covered a lot. Uh, digital, uh, the digital agenda is a government agenda. Um, for those who listened to uh, YB uh, Lim Guan Eng's budget speech in October this year, you will realize that the Malaysian government has put in a tune of about close to 3 billion ringgit to try to revitalize the digital space. Um, a lot of it has to do with upskilling of not just talent, but also businesses, uh, so that they are ready for the digital space. Uh, there are funds allocated for it. Um, I think, don't quote me, but I, I think it's under MDEC, uh, where there's a digital matching fund uh, of up to 10,000 ringgit. So if you spend 10,000 on, say, adopting digital platforms for your HR payroll, talent management, and whatnot, uh, adopting e-payments, e-POS systems, you can actually get a, uh, a matching grant for it. So, so those are things that I think the government are bullish on and have actually put money to support uh, SMEs to adopt more of this solution. Um, and, and moving forward, you will see more and more of this type of offering uh, to get um, most of the SMEs in Malaysia moving towards that direction. Um, so that's just a snippet, but there's a whole list of different things that the government uh, have, have put aside. Um, the other thing that's very interesting is the government is going into also what is known as uh, digital sandboxing, uh, especially looking at disruptive technology um, that could enter the Malaysian market. Um, how many of you here own a drone or have heard of a drone drone system? I'm guessing most of you would have heard of it. So drone is essentially a flying pod, right? Um, but the application for drones are widespread, right? Amazon is talking about delivering books 
via drones, delivering groceries via drones, right? Um, however, there are legal implications to it. So if you were to deliver books and somehow an accident happened and the drone dropped the books on somebody's head, who's actually liable for it? So there must be regulations and laws designed to protect uh, the public, right? So the government in Malaysia is actually looking into sandboxing and, and helping you know, bring in uh, key players and stakeholders to work together with them to build suitable regulations, not to stop the disruption, but really to encourage a safe usage of the technology in the, in the marketplace. So those are things that I think the government's working on, which to me being part of a government agency is extremely exciting. Um, and we want to see more of SMEs coming and talking to us about working with us in terms of you know, uh, the sandbox as also moving your business towards the digital space. So I hope I answered. Um, certainly, um, uh, the budget uh, announced for this year, or next year, uh, is quite favorable for the growth of SMEs and, and digital ag agenda is on the top. Um, and of course, uh, Magic uh, runs a lot of programs uh, in the startup and, and SME space in providing capacity building. Uh, and I believe there's some sort of funding involved as well. Uh, but it's predominantly capacity building. Um, thanks, uh, Jonathan. Um, my next question would be uh, to Paolo. It's just, to, uh, just a continuation of what Jonathan mentioned. Um, here we are actually building uh, an entire ecosystem. It constitutes um, um, larger corporations, um, SMEs, uh, regulators, and whatnot. Um, what are some of the prime connective uh, uh, measures uh, that are taken at this moment of time in terms of the actual growth of the e-marketplaces that can actually enhance uh, the adoptions of technology um, within the region and also in Malaysia? Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Thank you for the question. And uh, also let me just start to thank um, um, Star Media and Group and CIM Big Bank for the opportunity of being here. And, um, you know, welcome to my fellow panelists and uh, uh, to the moderator. Um, that's a very interesting question. Uh, so on, you know, uh, I think we already discussed uh, a lot today, very um, good points on the challenges on uh, the SME space, uh, what are the most uh, common uh, challenges that we see and it's uh, around you know, your labor force, um, um, your um, cost of uh, funding, and uh, today more and more uh, technology, right? So how you scale up and how you prepare yourself to be more agile, uh, faster. Uh, so usually this, this, there's more and more this, um, this sense that um, what matters today is not to be big. The big is not going to beat the small. It's all about agility and being faster. So the fast will beat the slow and the ones that are more rigid and uh, unable to, to adapt to the, to the changes. So technology there plays um, a, huge, um, a huge role. Um, in if we are talking about and thank you for your introduction you know on the evolution of uh, markets and the example the very vivid example um, today we talk a lot about uh, e-commerce e-marketing and there you know in terms of technology uh, things that we see that are going to be playing a bigger and bigger role um, it's also a topic that was already addressed today everything that is related to data so your data is fundamental, but trying to make sense of that data and use it to create insights that will help to grow your business uh, and help you to solve problems for your customers and your consumers is fundamental. Um, some examples of how, to, um, how you're going to get more and more help uh, nowadays in chewing all of that data, it's for instance your predictive uh, analytics or uh, AI, machine learning as a sub uh, aspect of um, AI. Predictive analytics, with predictive analytics, what you can do today is uh, start to try to preview and to uh, forecast some future tendencies based on uh, your past behavior. Um, so that's fundamental. You need good data to start with because, you know, if your data is not there or if it's not structured, then you will have a lot more. 
uh, work to try to make sense um, out of it. Then, predictive analytics, what it has mainly, it's an algorithm, it's a, um, it's, it's a statistical model that will treat that data and work with some assumptions. So uh, assumptions, it's one of the most basic ones is that uh, you know, past behavior can help you to forecast your future uh, tendencies. But there is a lot of others that, that you can use. Um, machine learning is the next step on top of this. So machine learning, it's not only this, not only a statistic model that will be operating with a certain input to deliver you an output, but a system that can learn, that can continue to learn by itself um, as long as you feed um, the right set of data, it can be you know past data, or even if you have your own e-commerce <coughs> or e-marketplace, it can be live data that is coming from your platform, and the system will help you to um, to to learn, to do some of the most uh, fundamental functions for you today. For instance, if you're talking about uh, fraud management or uh, risk assessment. Churn. If you want to uh, understand if a customer is about to churn, um, you know that's one of the most common applications today of uh, machine learning because, you know, based on the past behavior, you can understand if someone uh, is getting to the point where they are about to switch to some other player in the market, and you can try to um, um, still do something about it. Uh, the last one, it's one that is very dear to me. Um, everything that is uh, to do with forecasting, machine learning is really getting. So for instance, just for you to understand, I'm the, the sales director here in Malaysia. For the past two years, I don't do sales forecast. Machine learning does it for me. Because you know the machine can predict better than me taking into consideration all the inputs what is going to be my uh, forecast for this quarter. So for the past two years, I don't need to go to you know uh, SLT meeting saying that my number for this quarter is going to be this one. It's already done. So you uh, save a lot in terms of productivity in meetings, in efficiency. Um, so that's that's a, a very interesting um, use case. Um, all these said, <coughs> the last point I would like to to make is really on a point that was also mentioned by Jonathan: um, upskilling. That's fundamental. So with this transformation. Um, there will be in different in industries a lot of um, jobs that are going to be, you know, uh, um, that are going to be put away. But there is also the creation of a lot of new jobs, and fundamental here is this uh, upskilling, this skilling up of uh, your workforce for these new functions that are going to be needed uh, for this um, near-term and mid-term future. Um, Microsoft is working with uh, some partners here in uh, Malaysia and also in Southeast Asia, for instance, with, with Grab. Grab for Good is a program uh, where, you know, through the use of technology, we are trying to uh, help people to, you know, skill up and uh, have a brighter future also in this, um, in this world. I hope this answers your question. Thank, Thank you, you, Paolo. Um, uh, my next uh, question to uh, Leroy. Leroy, um, in, in business and in, in trade, human interaction is a, a vital thing. Um, two parties need to trust one another in order to uh, carry on doing businesses. Will technology be able to bridge that gap if, let's say, we are going cross-border or uh, transactions and technology, but where it, it, there are schools of thought that say that there will come a time <coughs> whereby uh, machines will be transacting and there will, will not be any human interaction in between. Uh, but again, when the and the other lot says that there will always be a human at the end of the day who does make the decision. So trust in business uh, is something that is being talked about and, and, and technology as in blockchain is one that says that does bridge the gap to some extent. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah. Thank you very much for the question, Shah. I mean, the premise of trust is definitely what I would like to touch on, right? So let's fall into um, firstly how you started by saying the difference between functionality and utility and then let's bring it to trust, right? So I think today, um, let me just set 
a more human um, approach first and foremost because you mentioned humans versus machines. I think humans are definitely here to stay. And talking about humans, which is the consumers, when you talk about utility, I think one of the biggest driving forces of the changes in utility would definitely be consumer behavior and consumer needs. And we live in an age today, right, where never before has the consumer become more conscious and more aware of what they're buying and what they're eating. Of course, in Malaysia, we're not at the point where we are boycotting a company just because they're not ethical, right? But it's slowly cascading into the local lifestyle, right? So people are starting to ask questions on, is this sustainably made? Is this um, halal? Is this uh, where is my coffee bean produced? Questions like that, right? And at the center of it is because one key element is missing, trust, right? And blockchain technology today, it's what is being empowering and what is being used to address the premise of trust. Let me give you two very good examples globally, right? One would be, say, Starbucks. Starbucks, in recent years, um, they came under a little bit of a media controversy of sorts when they were questioned whether or not the beans that they use for the coffee are actually of fair trade, whether or are they grown sustainably. So fast forward to today, I was just talking to Paolo about this. Um, they are actually partnering with Microsoft to do a bean to cup initiative <laughs> using blockchain to prove that all the beans used to produce all their coffee are actually grown from sustainable farms in different parts of the world, right? And then, not too long ago as well, a big uh, global, or rather a big US company, Walmart, right? The biggest retailer there. They came under fire as well. They had an issue, okay, I would, I would say they, have an e they had an issue with food poisoning, right? Some of the people there got food poisoning because of uh, lettuces sold in Walmart. And as a result, once again, fast forward today, they too have launched their own food safety uh, blockchain, being able to, uh, being able to um, pinpoint exactly where all their produce comes from using blockchain. So why are people using blockchain? Because for those of you who are not familiar with blockchain, how blockchain works is similar. It's basically a ledger, or should I say a book, where any one of you, any one of us here, can look into and see the entire trail not just when it comes to money, but when it comes to physical assets. For example, a bundle of letters in Walmart. So that, by addressing this premise of trust, right, we are also addressing a very fundamental problem that plagues e-marketplaces globally. The goods, whether or not this is authentic or genuine. Right? So today, there are a lot of companies that are going into the space. One of it actually came out of magic in Malaysia itself, the company is called Luxtech. So what Luxtech is doing in Malaysia is two things. Firstly, they are working with a Swiss uh, luxury watch brand that are importing their watches here into Malaysia and to certify that these watches are authentic from the point of manufacturing in Switzerland. Right, that's. And another thing that, that Luxtech is known for in Malaysia is they are working with the Ministry of Education to combat fake degrees. By putting educational certification on blockchain, Today, um, issues like fake degrees uh, won't be an issue anymore, right? So I think what a technology like blockchain does is create a, a global connection and ecosystem of trust, uh, which would facilitate a lot of cross-border transactions because I think a lot of us would love to shop on Taobao and Alibaba, but we are always plagued with that question that I just mentioned, right? So with more, with a, with a, safe environment of trust empowered by technology like blockchain for example that would really put us at ease to be able to shop with full security and trust and that applies with uh, the halal industry as well for course now we can know without a shred of a doubt that even you talk about ayam right you can even talk about how the ayam is assembled and put in a blockchain right so it's to that extent the trust creation that's being uh, put on the ecosystem today um, just a very quick um, question. Um, it was um, last week, um, I was talking to my four-year-old niece and when I called her, uh, she, uh, when I asked, what are you doing? Um, she was like, we are shopping. And I was like, oh, you're at the mall. So, no, 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 we're shopping. Mall is when we go for outing. So what she was referring to her mother sister is actually buying stuff online so within a generation about 20 or 30 years or so so the whole perception about 
how we shop is changing. So for a four-year-old, um, shopping is just you know buying stuff using your phone or your laptop. It's no longer going out to a physical space. But then again, that's a four-year-old talking, right? Um, will this ever come? Uh, uh, will this ever be real, whereby there will not be any physical places where trade is happening? It will all be virtual. What do you think, Johnson? Very quick. Uh, yeah. um, <clears throat> I think uh, it's, it's difficult to speak for everyone. So different consumers will have different preference. Uh, people who like to go and dine out will always go and dine out because for special purposes or special reasons. Uh, but for those who don't want to dine out, there's your grab food and your food panda, right? So, so I think there will always be uh, uh, businesses that will cater to both needs. Um, but you are right. I think with uh, the younger consumers growing up in a highly digital space, um, you know, these guys, like your four-year-old, even my, for my 15-year-old son, he doesn't know a time where smartphone doesn't exist, right? To him, smartphone is commonplace, it's mainstream, right? And more and more of this youth that are coming up will leverage of technology for their day-to-day -day lives. So as businesses, knowing this, what must you guys do to ensure that you are still relevant in the next five, ten years time, right? Um, do you want to adopt a digital technology? How many of you are in the F&B space? Have a retail F&B outlet? No, nobody in the F&B space. I find that, oh, there's one gentleman there. I find that very hard to believe in Malaysia. <laughs> nobody is in F&B <laughs> space. Um, but if you talk about business today in F&B space. The food delivery is just version, maybe version two or version three, right? Moving forward, we're talking about things like cloud kitchen, right? Dark kitchen, what does that even mean? It's just a central location where there are 20, 30, 50 central kitchens that are preparing food for the sole purpose of delivery. They don't have a physical outlet. They cook there, they deliver directly to your doorsteps. It's happening now in Malaysia. Right? Most people are not aware of it, but it's already happening in Malaysia under the radar. So as a business, if you own an F&B retail outlet, what would your strategy be? Right? You have to take those kind of things into consideration. Yeah, very quickly, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have a lot of time and we have to open to the floor as well. Yeah. So in your opinion, Will this ever come to light with all the AI um, and machine learning that we've talked about? Will it ever happen that uh, what my four-year-old said will come true? <laughs> well, um, in short, I, I don't think so. Right. But um, I totally agree with, uh, with Jonathan. You will ha always have um, um, different needs uh, that will be ad addressed uh, through different, just, uh, just to, to complement the the dark kitchen example, for instance, um, you have not only dark kitchens where someone is now um, just, you know, uh, cooking to uh, deliver through uh, grab food, or but you have even uh, these concepts of um, startups. So for dark kitchens, you have places where they just have the infrastructure and services, like they clean at the end. You come, cook, and you pay by the hour, and you go. So. Even if you want to test, if you want to be a dark kitchen in the future, you have business models that are opening now just for you to try. You see if it works. If it works, then you can set up your own place because you cannot stay there forever because they only have a limited space. So you see this agility in, term, agility in terms of, uh, of the models. They will find the right way to serve you. And as long as the market is there, you know, Alal or some, some other market, as long as the market is there, the business model will follow and business people will address it and you will have a way to fulfill those, those needs. So my honest opinion, but this is a personal one, I think that a certain degree of human interaction will always be needed. Look at uh, social platforms, all the debate that you have today, right? Sometime in the past it seemed like, you know, now everyone is going to be friends online and, and now you even start to rethink the model. The like button is going away. 
you know, you don't have the counts on. So this will evolve. And, you know, as humans, you will always need that uh, human touch as well, that experience, that the other things, you know, if you want to go and dine out, that's because of the experience. It's not just because of the utility of it. Right. It's not just because you need food, right? right. In your belly. True. True. Okay. True. Great. Leroy. Yeah, so very quickly, um, in one sentence, I would say, Technology is here to enrich lifestyle, not dictate lifestyle, right? But I do agree that technology would definitely take away proximity and physical walls. Meaning to say, human interaction would definitely be still here. Experience is, will definitely be here. But remove physical barriers of space. I mean, moving forward to talk to my relatives in Australia or Hong Kong, it's going to be a lot more frictionless. I can't imagine how it's going to be with things like AR that is, uh, for example, Facebook is experiment experimenting with. Yeah, so that's my short answer. Right. Great, so markets uh, will solve the problem on its own, right? And then and it's all about uh, demand and supply. So if there's a demand for cloud kitchens up in the cloud somewhere, there will be uh, businesses offering those services. Great. Um, now's the time when we would like to open uh, for questions for the audience. Please do enrich us with your questions. And uh, yeah, and, and, and please uh, just uh, uh, a reminder, please make it as, a que uh, it as a question and not as an opinion. Great, thank you. What is the difference between magic and MDEC? in terms of mandate to help support startups in the tech. Okay, so this, this, this is, is what a, we... This is a question for Leroy, right? Yeah, so... <laughs> Leroy, what do you think? Because, you know, we need to have uh, some sort of third party involvement here. So what no, do you I think? Th I think we get this question a lot. So MDEC is, uh, they are mandates digital. So they are an industry focused government agency. Our mandate is entrepreneurship. So we cut across the board. So we work with entrepreneurs. Um, we are a little bit skewed towards startups, uh, not by design, partly because there are more and more startups coming into the forefront. So no longer are people starting a business and calling themselves SMEs. All of these guys are startups because they have uh, interesting business model that help them scale or they adopt technology as an enabler, right? Uh, so. Today, if you are a business and you don't have technology as an enabler, then I think you guys have to seriously look at your you know, survival for the next five years. Uh, and, and that's how we differ. Um, both of us work together closely, MDEC and MMagic. Uh, quite often, we are at the very early of stages where we channel more startups who are growing and scaling to our uh, cousins at MDEC. And they will then bring these guys to global markets. So I hope that I answered that question. Right. Yeah. Um, just to add, because I'm ex MDEC, so <laughs> <laughs> um, MDEC deals uh, more. I mean, there are overlaps, definitely, uh, of what Magic does, um, but what MDEC actually is mandated to do is to grow um, startups and scale ups, not from an ideation perspective. But if they have reached a certain stage whereby um, they have an MVP in place uh, and they want to commercialize it, then MDEC helps out in from a prospect of, of, of providing some human capital and also from a funding perspective. And also one of their mandate is to attract startups from overseas, which they call as re-domiciling. So that is one uh, of the aspects that they do as well. All right, uh, next question. Um, we live in era of cashless, which is no used physical money lifestyle. The question is, cryptocurrency, uh, cryptocurrency reliable used for payment these days? So, uh, crypto, yeah, all right, interesting. <laughs> okay, um, let me answer this question in two parts, right? Firstly, is it reliable? I would comment firstly about security. I would say in terms of security, use paying using cryptocurrency is definitely a lot safer. I give you a very, very simple example. When you do authenticate a payment using cryptocurrency, you just press a button and the only thing, the only piece of data that gets tied back to you is a random string of code. 
that is your wallet address. That's all. So you don't put in things like your credit card details or like your CVV or whatever two-factor um, security, right? So that is a simple part of our security. But I think reliability has to come with another factor, which is the stableness or the volatility of cryptocurrency, which today is very highly de debated, right? So I think this is going to change next year, right? Simply because of things like Facebook Libra, simply because next year, the Chinese are launching their own digital currency using blockchain as well. And this Facebook, both Facebook Libra and the Chinese digital currency is going to be backed by both the USD and their own sovereign currencies. Meaning to say, the price of this cryptocurrency will be stable. When, when that happens, we can then talk about transacting using cryptocurrency because then the value is packed, there's no volatility and business will not be, uh, the, the PNL of businesses will not be affected. Right, um, Paolo, could you add uh, in terms of does it have to be crypto for it to be cashless? Uh, no, but um, you know, as Leroy well mentioned, I think that there is certain aspects of security and traceability with uh, uh, blockchain uh, and with um, crypto um, that are you know that are um, that are um, that increase your reliability and, and security. It can be cashless. You have all your um, e-wallets today, and they are not tied to, to crypto. So you can decouple uh, this effect of uh, today crypto are still um, a lot speculative and um, volatile uh, um, currencies. Uh, in the future, um, I'm, I will really be looking at that um, big battle that is going to happen, I think, <laughs> uh, to try to fight for the predominance in that space. Hopefully, you know, uh, it's not going to be a monopoly. Hopefully, it's not going to be someone, uh, the winner takes it all, but we will have a, uh, a system where you have more players, and that will also be good, not only for um, uh, competition and uh, stabilizing prices, but also um, to uh, ensure that stabilization in terms of um, the, the currency. Now, it doesn't need to be. Uh, I think that the future, with these two uh, players coming into market and with this uh, unfolding battle that we are going to, all of us are going to assist, I think it's going to sink in into, into the economy and uh, it's going to bring also new ways, um, not only to, to pay, but also to do business even in B2B scenarios. I think it's, uh, it's going to change a lot that landscape as well. Right. Um, Okay, how do we add blockchain to secure a contract? Do you want to take it? <laughs> Leroy, how yeah. about, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm hesitating because it's, it's, it's rather weak, so it can be answered a lot of different ways. So I think, <laughs> um, to put it very simply, um, I would say, if there are two, 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 two types of contracts. One is a business contract, right? If party A uh, puts up capital of X amount, uh, party B will give you goods of X amount, right? So uh, traditionally, uh, traditionally, what happens is you have like third party or you have escrow services that are there to facilitate such trades. But with blockchain, uh, you can now do it without any intermediaries, right? Because there's the element of trust that's inbuilt into the blockchain architecture itself. So I think that would probably be the simplest way to answer, yeah. So basically, it's actually a set of codes that dictate if something happens, do this, right? Um, it's just to say that if, if without someone coming in between or a lawyer to actually wet it, if let's say uh, Leroy is, is asking 10 bucks for a house and I say, okay, I will pay you 10 bucks, the minute I, I make the payment, it will be an auto uh, transfer of ownership. And, and this is the automation that a smart contract does. Um, so yeah, it reduces cost and trust and all that sort of things. Okay, um, next question. Uh, again, for Leroy, eh? <laughs> Blockchain. Um, okay, all right. Uh, can I take the, 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 the one the end bit, which is not uh, too blockchain oriented at this moment? I think you can take Leroy um, offline and then talk uh, blockchain. <laughs> uh, okay, 
how many SME in Malaysia are using Microsoft BI successfully? Okay, that's a, that's a very good one. Well, uh, definitely an uh, increasing, uh, increasing number. Um, right now, the um, uh, um, market penetration, I would say, of the family of products that includes uh, our Power BI tool, uh, it's in the vicinity of 10%. So uh, if you think that uh, you know, SMEs in Malaysia, it's uh, 900,000, uh, it's, it's a huge number that is already that has already the tool. Now, one thing with Microsoft usually is uh, what do you buy? Because Microsoft has this um, strategy of going to market with uh, bundles. Then the other thing is if you're using it and if you're using it well or not. Because um, when you buy um, uh, a bundle, uh, usually you can, it can be to fulfill a certain need around productivity, maybe you know what you really need is to solve the problem in your email, or uh, you want to uh, communicate with your family in Australia and uh, you're using Teams or Skype or uh, some other. Usually all of this comes in bundle and in Microsoft, the name of the product in Microsoft is Power BI. That's the one that is used to expose data in a way that is more meaningful and uh, more easy to consume uh, for businesses purposes. Um, so, penetration is, uh, is, is big and is getting, uh, is getting it's, it's increasing. Um, what we are trying to do uh, with a certain set of programs uh, is to ensure that customers are realizing the value of the investment that they already made. So, we have programs to help uh, SMEs to um, adopt and use better that particular part of BI. Um, it's fundamental. I think it's going to be uh, probably the one that is already ready to be ripe today because the tools are there. Uh, is if you can uh, start to structure your data in a meaningful way and then consume it also in terms of business to be able to do better decisions and faster decisions in terms of um, you know things that you want to do in the market. Um, okay. Um, are there any shortcuts to getting my traditional business into the e-market space? Uh, Jonathan, would you like to take this? Uh, no shortcuts. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it depends on what sort of business it is and uh, whether you are retail that's selling products and you want to go onto a, a marketplace like, let's say, Shopee or Lazada, that's always that kind of option. Um, but I think more importantly, and I want to uh, touch on, on digitization, uh, is because the important component of data, as what uh, my colleague here has mentioned, data and the ability to analyze and understand data, right? Because this allows for better decision making. Uh, and, and whether you want to still have a retail outlet or whether you want to go on onto the digital platform of marketplaces, you can now make that decision confidently, right? Uh, and the cost, I would say, people always tell me that um, cost of going digital is cheaper than a traditional business. I beg to differ. I think running business has its own cost. It's always going to be about the same, right? You still need marketing. You still need uh, people to do sales. So the cost is always going to be about the same. You're removing a retail physical outlet cost, but it will be just a different cost that you have to bear. So I would say at the end of the day, you know, if you have data, then you can make this decision. Without the data, then you're just shooting in the dark, right? So, you know, it may, you may be a business that don't need to go on marketplaces, right? And you just follow the trend and go into marketplaces uh, or have your products listed on marketplaces, it may not do as well uh, as you think it would be. So have the data, analyze the data, understand what it is, then make the business decision. Uh, and I actually want to shout out to Microsoft as well. Microsoft is a partner of Magic, and have, yeah. So we, our, a lot of our startups use uh, Microsoft Bizpark Plus, uh, which is, is, is offered to our startups. Yeah. So thank you so much. Uh, just, just to complement here, I think uh, one, one interest uh, aspect, and it's also related to the previous question, uh, maybe not just talking about you know, Power BI and the tools from Microsoft, but uh, overall, 
Um, it's interesting to see that uh, in terms of adoption of Industry 4.0, Malaysia is really well. So we compare very well to other countries in the region. Uh, I think we are only behind uh, China and Hong Kong, even Singapore. Or, um, and uh, three technologies in uh, Industry 4.0 that are more used by SMEs, it's first one, mobile payment. <laughs> That's not news, right? It's, I think it's like 80% uh, or more than 80%. Then the second one is uh, automation software. We already talked about it uh, as well. And even you know the incentives that you're seeing now from uh, Maida from uh, MDAC, also point ERP, all of, the, all of, the, all of that uh, part. And the third one, interestingly enough, it's BI. Right. So, you know, Microsoft or not, but it's being used. So um, there's the, 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 the pool effect, the, you know, the demand effect is there. If it's Microsoft supplying it or not, yeah, I hope so. I hope that Microsoft can capture <laughs> uh, that, uh, that, that demand, but it's there. Right, right. Um, okay. Uh, this will be our last question very quickly. Um, what on the upskilling aspect? Uh, we know that, um, as Paolo mentioned, there will be jobs that would require people to upscale. What are some of the key competencies uh, that are required for businesses um, when they are hiring a new staff? What are the key competencies they're looking for the new hire, for example? Very quickly, very quickly. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, so from from our side, and I can, s I, you know, I, I I can talk about what we are seeing even in our own ecosystem. So we have a huge ecosystem of partners, and and this is a real problem. Okay, because uh, you see that there is even a lot of churn uh, between partners and uh, between MNCs and companies that are hiring in Malaysia, and this skills are still very scarce. Everything that is related to data, everything that is, you know, even just uh, the most technical job, DBA analysis, you know, it's, they are highly required. Uh, as soon as someone gets a certification on, you know, Microsoft and some other uh, certification from one of the providers, it will start to be a resource that will be targeted and someone will try to capture it. So. That's a huge effort from our side right now on how do we, not only uh, at Microsoft, but through the whole ecosystems of partners, how do we skill up and how do we uh, help to bring this, everything that is related to data, AI, machine learning, um, infrastructure, uh, cloud services, all of these are crucial aspects for the growth and to um, be the baseline for the new business models of, uh, of the future. Leroy, would you like to add to it? Well, coming from where Paolo uh, was saying, I think being in a nascent industry, this challenge is even more predominant. So uh, this is actually an effort that uh, NAM is really championing in Malaysia. So we are actually working with all the local universities. We're working with a lot of our skill development centers in Malaysia to actually upskill uh, the local talent, right? Um, but what I like to say here is today we are in a, not just a gig economy world, but a data and a learning sharing uh, world. I mean, you go online, there are places like Udemy, Coursera, and all this that you can actually pick up all these skills. So I think it's um, about individual initiative, I would say. Yeah. Right. Um, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to close this session. Um, please give a load of applause to our distinguished speakers for sharing knowledge. <laughs> Thank you. And one more time for yourselves as well. You've been a brilliant audience. Thank you. All right, thank you very much to our... Thank you very much to all our panelists and moderator. Please give a round of applause to Mr. Jonathan Lee from Magic Malaysia, Mr. Paolo Collado from Microsoft Asia, Mr. Lee Roymar from NEM Blockchain, and Mr. Shah Muhammad Ali from Prevasure Technologies, Burhat. Once again, we would like to thank you, Mr. Lee Hingwei, Mr. Wilson Beh, Mr. Husam Sultan, Mr. Jonathan Lee, Mr. Paolo Collado, Mr. Lee Roima, and Mr. Shah Muhammad Ali. Seven speakers in total today. Very awesome. For their powerful and humble sharing experiences for this forum. On behalf of this SME Thought Leadership Organizing Committee, partners and sponsors, we would like to thank all of our speakers for sharing your knowledge with us and also to you, our participants, for joining us today in today's sessions. 
with such an enthusiastic spirit. A gentle reminder to fill up the feedback form and return it to our crews on your way out. The SME Thought Leadership Series is brought to you by Star Media Group and presented by CIMB Bank Berhad. For more information on CIMB's products, please do visit CIMB booth outside. Lunch is available at the foyer. Bon appetit. Thank you and have a pleasant day ahead, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.